From Jesus to Christ by Rudolf Steiner. These lectures were given in 1911 and this is Lecture 5. If you recall that in the course of our lectures we have come to look upon the Christ impulse as the most profound event in human evolution, you will doubtless agree that some exertion of our powers of mind and spirit is needed to understand its full meaning and range of influence. Certainly in the widest circles we find the bad habit of saying that the highest things in the world must be comprehensible in the simplest terms. If what someone is constrained to say about the sources of existence appears complicated, people turn away from it because the truth must be simple. In the last resort it certainly is simple. But if at a certain stage we wish to learn to know the highest things, it is not hard to see that we must first clear the way to understanding them. And in order to enter into the full greatness, the full significance of the Christ impulse from a particular point of view, we must bring together many different matters. We need only turn to the Pauline epistles and we shall soon see that Paul, who sought especially to bring within range of human minds the supersensible nature of the Christ being, has drawn into the concept, the idea of the Christ, the whole of human evolution, so to speak. If we let the Pauline epistles work upon us, we have finally something which, through its extraordinary simplicity, and through the deeply penetrating quality of the words and sentences, makes a most significant impression. But this is so only because Paul, through his own initiation, had worked his way up to that simplicity, which is not the starting point of what is true, but the consequence, the goal. If we wish to penetrate into what Paul was able to finally express in wonderful, monumental, simple words concerning the Christ being, we must come nearer to an understanding of human nature, for whose further development on earth the Christ impulse came. Let us therefore consider what we already know concerning human nature as shown through occult sight. We divide the life of man into two parts, the period between birth and death, and the period which runs its course between death and a new birth. Let us first of all look at man in his physical body. We know that occult sight sees him as a fourfold being, but as a fourfold being in process of development. A cold sight sees the physical body, etheric body, astral body and the ego. We know that in order to understand human evolution, we must learn the occult truth that this ego, of which we become aware in our feelings and perceptions when we simply look away from the external world and try to live within ourselves, goes on from incarnation to incarnation. But we also know that this ego is, as it were, ensheathed although in sheathed is not a good expression, we can use it for the present, by three other members of human nature, the astral body, the etheric body and the physical body. Of the astral body we know that in a certain respect it is the companion of the ego through the various incarnations. For though during the Kamaloka time much of the astral body must be shed, it remains as a kind of force body which holds together the moral, intellectual and aesthetic progress we have stored up during an incarnation. Whatever constitutes true progress is held together by the power of the astral body, is carried from one incarnation to another and is linked, as it were, with the ego which passes the fundamentally eternal in us from incarnation to incarnation. I'm wondering here if I should be saying ego Further, we know that from the etheric body too, very much is cast off immediately after death. But an extract of this etheric body remains with us, an extract we take with us from one incarnation to another. In the first days directly after death, we have before us a kind of backward review, like a great tableau, of our life up to that time, and we take with us a concentrated etheric extract. The rest of the etheric body is given over into the general etheric world in one form or another, according to the development of the person concerned. When, however, we look at the fourth member of the human being, the physical body, it seems at first as if the physical body simply disappears into the physical world. 
One might say that this can be externally demonstrated, for to external sight the physical body is brought in one way or another to dissolution. The question, however, which everyone who occupies himself with spiritual science must put to himself is the following. Is not all that external physical cognition can tell us about the fate of our physical body, perhaps only Maya? The answer does not lie very far away for anyone who has begun to understand spiritual science. When a man can say to himself, all that is offered by sense appearance is Maya, external illusion, how can he think it really true that the physical body, delivered over to the grave or to the fire, disappears without trace, however crudely the appearance may obtrude on his senses? Perhaps, behind the external mire, there lies something much deeper. Let us go further into this. You will realise that in order to understand the evolution of the Earth, we must know the earlier embodiments of our planet. We must study the Saturn, Sun and Moon embodiments of the Earth. We know that the Earth has gone through its incarnations just as every human being has done. Our physical body was prepared in the course of human evolution from the Saturn period of the Earth. With regard to the ancient Saturn time, we cannot speak at all of etheric body, astral body and ego in the sense of the present day. But the germ for the physical body was already sown was embodied during the Saturn evolution. During the Sun period of the Earth, this germ was transformed and then in this germ, in its altered form, the etheric was embodied. During the Moon period of the Earth, the physical body was again transformed and in it, and at the same time in the etheric body, which also came forth in an altered form, the astral body was incorporated. During the Earth period, the ego was incorporated. And is it conceivable that the part of us which was embedded during this Saturn period, our physical body, simply decomposes or is burned up and disappears into the elements after the most significant endeavours have been made by divine spiritual beings through millions and millions of years during the Saturn, Sun and Moon period in order to produce this physical body? If this were true, we should have before us the very remarkable fact that through three planetary stages, Saturn, Sun, Moon, a whole host of divine beings work to produce a cosmic element such as our physical body is, and that during the Earth period this cosmic element is destined to vanish every time a person dies. It would be a remarkable drama if Maya, an external observation knows nothing else, were right. So now we ask, can Maya be right? At first, it certainly seems as though occult knowledge declares Maya to be correct, for, strangely enough, occult knowledge seems in this case to harmonise with Maya. When we study the description given by spiritual knowledge of the development of man after death, we find that scarcely any notice is taken of the physical body. We are told that the physical body is thrown off, is given over to the elements of the earth. We are told about the etheric body, the astral body, the ego. The physical body is not further touched upon, and it seems as though the silence of spiritual knowledge were giving tacit assent to Maya knowledge. So it seems, and in a certain way we are justified by spiritual science in speaking thus, for everything further must be left to a deeper grounding in Christology. For concerning what goes beyond Maya with regard to the physical body, we cannot speak at all correctly unless the Christ impulse and everything connected with it has first been sufficiently explained. If we observe how this physical body was experienced at some definite moment in the past, we shall reach a quite remarkable result. Let us inquire into three kinds of folk consciousness, three different forms of human consciousness concerning all that is connected with our physical body during decisive periods in human evolution. We will inquire first of all among the Greeks. We know that the Greeks were that remarkable people who rose to their highest development in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch of civilization. We know that this epoch began about the 8th century before our era and ended in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries after the event of Palestine. We can easily confirm what is said about this period from external information, traditions and documents. The first dimly 
clear accounts concerning Greece hardly go back farther than the 6th or 7th century before our era, though legendary accounts come down from still earlier times. We know that the greatness of the historical period of Greece has its source in the preceding period, the third post-Atlantean epoch. The inspired utterances of Homer reach back into the period preceding the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, and Ashichilius, who lived so early that a number of his works have been lost, points back to the drama of the mysteries, of which he offers us but an echo. The third post-Atlantean epoch extends into the Greek age, but in that age the fourth epoch comes to full expression. The wonderful Greek culture is the purest expression of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. Now there falls upon our ear a remarkable saying from this land of Greece, a saying which permits us to see deeply into the soul of man who felt himself truly a Greek, the saying of the hero, better a beggar in the upper world than a king in the land of shades. Here is a saying which portrays the deep susceptibility of the Greek soul. One might say that everything preserved to us of Greek classical beauty and classical greatness of the gradual formation of the human ideal in the external world, all this resounds to us from that same. Let us recall the wonderful training of the human body in Greek gymnastics and in the great games, which are only caricatured in these days by persons who understand nothing of what Greece really was. Every period has its own ideal, and we must keep this in mind if we want to understand how this development of the external physical body as it stands there in its own form on the physical plane, was a peculiar privilege of the Greek spirit. So too was the creation of human ideals in plastic art, the enhancement of the human form in sculpture, and if we then look at the character of the Greek consciousness as it held sway in a Pericles, for example, when a man had a feeling for the universally human, and yet could stand firmly on his own feet and feel like a lord and king in the domain of his city. When we let all this work upon us, then we must say that the real love of the Greek was for the human form as it stood there before him on the physical plane, and that aesthetics too were turned to account in the development of this form. Where this human form was so well loved and understood, one could give oneself up to the thought. When that which gives to man this beautiful form on the physical plane is taken away from human nature, one cannot value the remainder as highly as the part destroyed by death. This supreme love for the external form led unavoidably to a pessimistic view of what remains of man when he has passed through the gate of death. And we can fully understand that the Greek soul, having looked with so great a love upon the outer form, felt sad when compelled to think, this form is taken away from the human individuality. The human individuality lives on without this form. If for the moment one looks at it solely from the point of view of feeling, then we must say, we have in Greece that branch of the human race which most loved and valued the human body and underwent the deepest sorrow when the body perished in death. Now let us consider another consciousness which developed about the same time, the Buddha consciousness which had passed over from Buddha to his followers. There we have almost the opposite of the Greek attitude. We need only remember one thing. The kernel of the four great truths of Buddha is that human individuality is drawn by longing, by desire, into the existence where it is enshrouded by an external form. Into what kind of existence? Into an existence described in the Buddha teaching as birth is sorrow, sickness is sorrow, old age is sorrow, death is sorrow. The underlying thought in this kernel of Buddhism is that by being enshrouded in an external bodily sheath, our individuality, which at birth comes down from divine spiritual heights and returns to divine spiritual heights of death, is exposed to the pain of existence, to the sorrow of existence. Only one way of salvation for men is expressed in the four great holy truths of Buddha, to become free from external existence, to throw off the external sheath. This means transforming the individuality so that it comes as soon as possible into a condition which will permit this throwing off. We note that the active feeling here is the reverse of the feeling dominant among the Greeks. 
Just as strongly as the Greek loved and valued the external bodily sheath and felt the sadness of casting it aside, just as little did the adherent of Buddhism value it, regarding it as something to be cast aside as quickly as possible. And linked with this attitude was the struggle to overcome the craving for existence, an existence enshrouded by a bodily sheath. Let us go a little more deeply into these Buddhist thoughts. A kind of theoretical view meets us in Buddhism concerning the successful incarnations of man. It is not so much a question of what the individual thinks about the theory as of what has penetrated into the consciousness of the adherents of Buddhism. I have often described this. I have said that we have perhaps no better opportunity of feeling what an adherent of Buddhism might, must have felt in regard to the continual incarnations of man than by immersing ourselves in the traditional conversation between King Melinda and a Buddhist sage. Thou hast come in thy carriage, then reflect, O great king, said the sage Nagasena, that all thou hast in the carriage is nothing but the wheels, the shaft, the body of the carriage and the seat, and beyond these nothing else exists except a word which covers wheel, shaft, body of carriage, seat, and so on. Thus thou canst not speak of a special individuality of the carriage, but thou must clearly understand that carriage is an empty word if thou thinkest of anything else than its parts, its members. And another simile was chosen by Nagasena for King Miliander. Consider the almond fruit which grows on the tree, and reflect that out of another fruit a seed was taken, and laid in the earth and has decayed. Out of that seed the tree has grown and the almond fruit upon it. Canst thou say that the fruit on the tree has anything else in common other than name and external form with the fruit from which the seed was taken and laid in the earth where it decayed? A man, Nagasena meant to say, has just as much in common with the man of his preceding incarnation as the almond fruit on the tree has with the almond fruit which, as seed, was laid in the earth. Anyone who believes that the form which stands before us as man and is wafted away by death is anything else than name and form, believes something as false as he who thinks that in the carriage, in the name carriage, something else is contained than the parts of the carriage, the wheels, shaft and so on. From the preceding incarnation, nothing of what man calls his ego passes over into the new incarnation. That is important and we must repeatedly emphasise that it is not to the point how this or that person chooses to interpret this or that saying of the Buddha, but how Buddhism worked in the consciousness of the people, what it gave to their souls, and what it gave to their souls is indeed expressed with intense clearness and significance in this parable of King Melinda and the Buddhist sage. Of what we call the ego, or ego, and of which we say that it is first felt and perceived by man when he reflects upon his inner being, the Buddhist says that fundamentally it is something that flows into him and belongs to Maya as much as everything else that does not go from incarnation to incarnation. I have elsewhere mentioned that if a Christian sage were to be compared with the Buddhist one, he would have spoken differently to King Melindia. The Buddhist said to the king, consider the carriage, wheel, shaft and so on. They are parts of the carriage, and beyond these parts, carriage is only a name and a form. With the word carriage, thou hast named nothing real in the carriage. If thou wilt speak of what is real, thou must name the parts. In the same case, the Christian sage would have said, O wise King Melinda, thou hast come in thy carriage. Look at it. In it thou canst see only the wheels, the shaft, the body of the carriage, and so on. But I ask thee now, Canst thou travel hither with the wheels only, or with the shaft only, or with the seat only? Thou canst not tra travel hither on any of the separate parts. So far as they are parts, they make the carriage, but on the parts thou canst not come hither. In order that the assembled parts can make the carriage, something else is necessary. Something else is necessary than there being merely parts. There must first be the quite definite fault of the carriage, for it is this that brings together will, shaft, and so on. And the fault of the carriage is something very necessary. Thou canst indeed not see the fault, but thou must recognise it. 
The Christian sage would then turn to man and say, of the individual person now can see only the external body, the external acts and the external soul experiences. Thou seest in man just as little of his ego as in the name carriage, thou sees its separate parts. Something quite different is established within the parts, namely that which enables thee to travel hither. So also in man. Within all his parts, something quite different is established, namely that which constitutes the ego. The ego is something real, which as a supersensible entity goes from one incarnation to another. How can we make a diagram of the Buddhist teaching of reincarnation so that it will represent the corresponding Buddhist theory? With the circle, we indicate a man between birth and death. The man dies. The time when he dies is marked by the point when the circle touches the line AB. Now what remains of all that has been spellbound within his existence between birth and death? A summation of causes, the results of acts, of everything a man has done, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, clever or stupid. All that remains over in this way works on as a set of causes and so forms the causal nucleus for the next incarnation. Round this causal nucleus, new body sheaths are woven for the next incarnation. These body sheaths go through new experiences, as did the body sheaths around the earlier causal nucleus. From these experiences, there remains again a causal nucleus. It includes experiences that have come into it from earlier incarnations, together with experiences from its last life. Hence it serves as the causal nucleus for the next incarnation and so on. This means that what goes through the incarnations consists of nothing but causes and effects. There is no continuing ego to connect the incarnations, nothing but causes and effects working over from one incarnation into the next. So when in this incarnation I call myself an ego, this is not because the same ego was there in the preceding incarnation. What I call my ego is only a mire of the present incarnation. Anyone who really knows Buddhism must picture it in this way and he must clearly understand that what we call the ego has no place in Buddhism. Now let us go on to what we know through anthroposophical cognition. How has man never been able to develop his ego? Through the earth evolution. Only in the course of the earth evolution has he reached the stage of developing his ego. It was added to his physical body, etheric body and astral body on the earth. Now, if we remember all we had to say concerning the evolutionary phases of man during the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods, we know that during the Moon period the human physical body had not yet acquired a quite definite form. It received this first on earth. Hence we speak of the earth existence as the epoch in which the spirits of form first took place and metamorphosed the physical body of man so that it has its present form. This forming of the human physical body was necessary if the ego were to find a place in man. The physical earth body set down on the physical earth provided the foundation for the dawn of the ego as we know it. If we keep this in mind, what follows will no longer seem incomprehensible. With regard to the valuation of the ego among the Greeks, we saw that for them it was expressed externally in the human form. Let us now recall that Buddhism, according to its knowledge, sets out to overcome and cast off as quickly as possible the external form of the human physical body. Can we then wonder that in Buddhism we find no value attached to anything connected with this bodily form? It is the essence of Buddhism to value the external form of the physical body as little as it values the external form which the ego needs in order to come into being. Indeed, all this is completely set aside. Buddhism lost the form of the ego through the way in which it undervalued the physical body. Thus we see how these two spiritual currents are polarically opposed. The Greek current, which set the highest value on the external form of the physical body as the external form of the ego, and Buddhism, which requires that the external form of the physical body, with all craving after existence, shall be overcome as soon as possible, so that in its theory it has completely lost the ego. 
Between these two opposite world philosophies stands ancient Hebraism. Ancient Hebraism is far from thinking so poorly of the ego as Buddhism does. In Buddhism it is heresy to recognise a continuous ego going on from one incarnation to the next. But ancient Hebraism held very strongly to this so-called heresy and he would never have entered the mind of an adherent of that religion to suppose that his personal divine spark with which he connected his concept of the ego is lost when he goes through the gate of death. If we want to make clear how the ancient Hebrew regarded the matter, we must say that he felt himself connected in his inner being with the Godhead, intimately connected. He knew that through the finest threads of his soul life, as it were, he was dependent on the being of this Godhead. With regard to the concept of the ego, the ancient Hebrew was quite different from the Buddhist, but in another respect he was also very different from the Greek. When we survey these ancient times as a whole, we find that the estimation of human personality, and hence that valuation of the external human form which was peculiar to the Greek, is not present in ancient Hebrewism. For the Greek it would have been absolute nonsense to say, Thou shalt not make to thyself any image of thy God. He would not have understood if someone had said to him, Thou shalt not make to thyself an image of thy Zeus or thy Apollo. For he felt that the highest thing was the external form, and that the highest tribute a man could offer to the gods was to clothe them with this human form which he himself valued so much. Nothing would have seemed more absurd to him than the commandment, Thou shalt make to thyself no image of God. As artist, the Greek gave his human form to his gods. He thought of himself as made in the likeness of the divine, and he carried out his contests, his wrestling, his gymnastics, and so on, in order to become a real copy of the god. But the ancient Hebrew had the commandment, Thou shalt make to thyself no image of God. This was because he did not value the external form as the Greeks had done. He regarded it as unworthy in relation to the divine. The ancient Hebrew was as far removed from the one side from the disciple of Buddhism, who would have much preferred to cast off the human form entirely on passing through death, as he was on the other side from the Greek. He was mindful of the fact that it was this form that gave expression to the commands, the laws of the divine being, and he clearly understood that a righteous man handed down through the following generations what he, as a righteous man, had gathered together. Not the extinguishing of the form, but the handing of the, on of the form through the generations was what concerned the ancient Hebrew. His point of view stood midway between that of the Buddhist, who had lost the value of the ego, and that of the Greek, who saw in the form of the body the very highest, and felt it as sorrowful when the bodily form had to disappear with death. So these three views stand over against one another. And for a closer understanding of ancient Hebraism, we must make it clear that what the Hebrew valued as his ego was in a certain sense also the divine ego. The God lived on in humanity, lived within man. In his union with the God, the Hebrew felt at the same time his own ego and felt it to be coincident with the divine ego. The divine ego sustained him. The divine ego was active within him. The Greek said, I value my ego so greatly that I look with horror on what will happen to it after death. The Buddhist said, That which is the cause of the external form of man must fall away from man as soon as possible. The Hebrew said, I am united with God, that is my fate, and as long as I am united with him, I bear my fate. I know nothing else than the identification of my ego with the divine ego. This old Jewish mode of thought, standing midway between Greek thought and Buddhism, does not involve, as Greek thought does from the outset, a predisposition to tragedy in face of the phenomenon of death, but tragic feeling is indirectly present in it. It is truly Greek for the hero to say, better a beggar in the upper world, i.e. with the human bodily form, than a king in the realm of shades. But a Hebrew could could not have said it without something more, for the Hebrew knows that when in death his bodily form falls away, he remains united with God. 
He cannot fall into a tragic mood simply through the fact of death. Still, the predisposition to tragedy is present indirectly in ancient Hebraism and is expressed in the most wonderfully dramatic story ever written in ancient times, the story of Job. We see there how the ego of Job feels bound up with his God, how it comes into conflict with his God, but differently from the way in which the Greek ego comes into conflict. We are shown how misfortune after misfortune falls upon Job, although he is conscious that he is a righteous man and has done all he can to maintain the connection of his ego with the divine ego. And while it seems that his existence is blessed and ought to be blessed, a tragic fate breaks over him. Job is not aware of any sin. He is conscious that he has acted as a righteous man, must, must act towards his God. Word is brought to him that all his possessions have been destroyed, all his family slain. Then his external body, this divine form, is stricken with grievous disease. There he stands, the man who can consciously say to himself, Through the inward connection I feel with my God, I have striven to be righteous before my God. My fate decreed to me by this God has placed me in the world. It is the acts of this God which have fallen so heavenly upon me. And his wife stands there beside him and calls upon him in strange words to deny his God. These words are handed down correctly. They are one of the sayings which correspond exactly with the Akashic record. Renounce thy God, since thou hast to suffer so much, since he has brought these sufferings upon thee, and die. What endless depth lies in these words. Lose the consciousness of the connection with thy God, then thou wilt fall out of the divine connection, like a leaf from the tree, and thou, God, can no longer punish thee. But loss of the connection with God is at the same time death, for as long as the ego feels itself connected with God, death cannot touch it. The ego must first tear itself away from connection with God, then only can death touch it. According to outward appearance, everything is against righteous Job. His wife sees his suffering and advises him to renounce God and die. His friends come and say, You must have done this or that, for God never punishes a righteous man. But he is aware, as far as his personal consciousness is concerned, that he has done nothing unrighteous. Through the events he encounters in the external world, he stands before an immense tragedy. The tragedy of not being able to understand human existence, of feeling himself bound up with God and not understanding how what he is experiencing can have its source in God. Let us think of all this lying with its full weight upon a human soul. Let us think of this soul breaking forth into the words which have come down to us from the traditional story of Job. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that one day I shall again be clothed with my bones, with my skin, and that I shall look upon God with whom I am united. This consciousness of the indestructibility of the human individuality breaks forth from the soul of Job in spite of all the pain and suffering. So powerful is the consciousness of the ego as the inner content of the ancient human belief. But here we meet with something in the highest degree remarkable. I know that my Redeemer liveth, says Job. I know that one day I shall again be covered with my skin, and that with mine eyes I shall behold the glory of my God. Job brings into connection with the Redeemer thought the external body, skin and bones, eyes which see physically. Strange. Suddenly in this consciousness that stands midway between Greek thought and Buddhism, this ancient Hebrew consciousness, we meet a consciousness of the significance of the physical bodily form in connection with the Redeemer thought, which then becomes the foundation, the basis for the Christ thought. And when we take the answer of Job's wife, still more light falls in everything Job says. Renounce thy God and die. This signifies that he who does not renounce his God does not die. This is implied in these words. But then what does die mean? To die means to throw off the physical body. External Maya seems to say that the physical body passes over into the elements of the earth and, so to speak, disappears. Thus, in the answer of Job's wife, there lies the following. 
do what is necessary that thy physical body may disappear. It could not mean anything else, or the words of Job that follow would have no sense. For man can understand anything only if he can understand the means whereby God has placed us in the world, if, that is, he can understand the significance of the physical body. And Job himself says, for this too lies in his words, Oh, I know full well that I need not do anything that would bring about the complete disappearance of my physical body, for that would be only an external appearance. There is a possibility that my body may be saved, because my Redeemer liveth. This I cannot express otherwise than in the words, My skin, my bones will one day be recreated. With my eyes I shall behold the glory of my God. I can lawfully keep my physical body, but for this I must have the consciousness that my Redeemer liveth. So in this story of Job there comes before us for the first time a connection between the form of the physical body which the Buddhists would strip off, which sadly the Greek sees pass away, and the ego consciousness. We meet for the first time with something like a prospect of deliverance for that which the host of gods from ancient Saturn, Sun and Moon, down to the earth itself, have brought forth as the form of the physical body. And if the form is to be preserved, if we are to say of it that what has been given us of bones, skin and sense organs is to have an outcome, then we must add, I know that my Redeemer liveth. This is strange, someone might now say. Does it really follow from the story of Job that Christ awakens the dead and rescues the bodily form which the Greeks believed would disappear? And is there perhaps anything in the story to indicate that for the general evolution of humanity it is not right, in the full sense of the word, that the external bodily form should disappear completely? May it not be interwoven with the whole human evolutionary process? Has this connection a part to play in the future? Does it depend upon the Christ being? These questions are set before us, and they mean that we should have to widen in a certain connection what we have so far learned from spiritual science. We know that when we pass through the gate of death, we retain at least the etheric body, but we strip off the physical body entirely. We see it delivered up to the elements. But its form, which has been worked upon through millions and millions of years, is that lost in nothingness, or is it in some way retained? We consider this question in the light of the explanations you have heard today, and tomorrow we will approach it by asking, how is the impulse given to human evolution by the Christ related to the significance of the external physical body? That body which, throughout earth evolution, is consigned to the grave, the fire or the air, although the preservation of its form is necessary for the future of mankind. From Jesus to Christ by Rudolf Steiner, this is Lecture 6. By taking our start from what was said yesterday, we should be able to come nearer to the fundamental questions of Christianity and to penetrate into its essential nature. We shall see that only by this means can we see into the heart of what the Christ impulse has become for the evolution of humanity and what it will become in the future. People are always insisting that the answers to the highest questions must not be complicated. The truth must be brought directly to each person in the simplest way. In support of this, they argue, for example, that the Apostle John in his last years expressed the quintessence of Christianity in words of truth. Children love one another. No one, however, should conclude that a person who simply pronounces the words children love one another knows the essence of Christianity and of all truth for men. Before the Apostle John was entitled to pronounce these words, he had fulfilled various preconditions. We know it was at the end of a long life, in his 95th year, that he came to this utterance. Only by then, in that particular incarnation, had he earned the right to use such words. Indeed, he stands there as a witness that this saying, if it came from any chance individual, would not have the power it had from him. For he had achieved something else also. Although the critics disputed, he was the author of the John Gospel, the Apocalypse and the Epistle to John. Throughout his life he had not always said, children love one another, he had written a work which belongs to the most difficult productions of man, the Apocalypse and the John Gospel. 
which penetrates most intimately and deeply into the human soul. He had gained the right to pronounce such a saying only through a long life and through what he had accomplished. If anyone lives a life such as his and does what he did and then says, as he did, children, love one another, there are no grounds for objecting to it. We must, however, be quite clear that although some things can be compressed into a few words, so that these few words signify very much, the same few words may also say nothing. Many a person who pronounces a word of wisdom which in its proper setting would perhaps signify something very deep, believes that by merely uttering it he has said a very great deal. The writer of the Apocalypse and of the John Gospel, in his greatest age, could speak the words, children, love one another, out of the essence of Christianity. But the same words from the mouth of another person may be a mere phrase. We must gather matters for the understanding of Christianity from far afield, so that we may apply them to the simplest truths of daily life. Yesterday we had to approach the question, so fateful for modern thought, what are we to make of the physical body in relation to the full fold being of man? We shall see how the points brought out yesterday in looking at the differing views of the Greeks, the ancient Hebrews and the Buddhists, will lead us further towards understanding the nature of Christianity. But if we are to learn more concerning the fate of the physical body, we must first take up a question which is central to the whole Christian cosmic conception, a question which lies at the very core of Christianity. How it is with the resurrection of Christ? Must we not assume that for the understanding of Christianity it is essential to reach an understanding of the resurrection? To see how important this is, we need only recall a passage in the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 to 20. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he had raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we who are in Christ had only hope, we are of all men most to be pitied. But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We must remember that Christianity, in so far as it has extended over the world, began with Paul. And if we are disposed to take these important words seriously, we cannot simply pass them over by saying that we must leave the question of the resurrection unexplained. For what is it that Paul says? That the whole of Christianity has no justification, and the whole Christian faith no meaning, if the resurrection is not true. That is what is said by Paul with whom Christianity is a fact of history, had its starting point. And it means that anyone who is willing to give up the resurrection must give up Christianity as Paul understood it. And now let us pass over almost 2,000 years and ask people of the present day how, according to the requirements of modern culture, they stand with regard to the question of the resurrection. I shall not now take note of those who simply deny Jesus entirely, it is naturally quite easy for them to be clear regarding the question of the resurrection. If Jesus never lived, one need not trouble about the resurrection. Leaving such persons aside, we will turn to those who, about the middle or in the last third of the 19th century, had accepted the current ideas of our time, the time in which we are still living. We will ask them what they think, in conformity with the whole culture of our day, concerning the question of the resurrection. We will take a man who has gained great influence over the way of thinking of those who consider themselves best informed, David Friedrich Strauss. In his work on Remarus, a thinker of the 18th century, we read, The resurrection of Jesus is really a shibboleth, concerning which not only the various conceptions of Christianity, but the various world philosophies and stages of spiritual evolution 
are at variance. And in a Swiss journal, almost of the same date, we read, As soon as I can convince myself of the reality of the resurrection of Christ, this absolute miracle, I tear down the modern conception of the world. This breach in what I believe to be the invaluable order of nature would make an irreparable rent in my system, in my whole fault world. Let us ask how many persons of our present time who, according to the modern standpoint, must and do subscribe to these words would say, if I were obliged to recognise the resurrection as historical fact, I would tear down my whole system of thought, philosophical or otherwise. Let us ask how should the resurrection as historical fact fit in with a modern man's outlook on the world. Let us recall something indicated in my first public lecture on this subject, that the Gospels are to be taken first and foremost as initiation writings. The leading events depicted in the Gospels are fundamentally initiation events, events which had formerly taken place within the secret places of the temples of the mysteries, when this or that person, who had been deemed worthy, was initiated by the Hierophants. Such a person, after he had, he had been prepared for a long time, went through a kind of death and a kind of resurrection. He had also to go through certain situations in life which reappear for us in the Gospels, in the story of the temptation, the story set on the Mount of Olives, and other similar ones. That is why the accounts of ancient initiates, which do not aim to be biographies in the usual sense, show such a resemblance to the gospel stories of Christ Jesus. And when we read the history of the great initiates of Apollonius of Tyana, or indeed even of Buddha or Zarathustra, or the life of Osiris or of Orpheus, it often seems that important characteristics of their lives are the same as those narrated of Christ Jesus in the Gospels. But although we must grant that we have to seek in the initiation ceremonies of the old mysteries for the prototypes of important events narrated in the Gospels, on the other hand, we see quite clearly that the great teachings of the life of Christ Jesus are saturated throughout with individual details which are not intended as a mere repetition of initiation ceremonies but make it very plain that what is described is actual fact. Must we not say that we receive a remarkably factual impression when the following is pictured for us in the Gospel of John 20, verses 1 to 10? Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went towards the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkins which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture, he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God, your God. 
Here is a situation described in such detail that if we wish to picture it in imagination, there is hardly anything lacking. When, for example, it is said that the one disciple runs faster than the other, or that the napkin which had covered the head was laid aside in another place, and so on. In every detail, something is described which would have no meaning if it did not refer to a fact. Attention was drawn on a former occasion to one detail that Mary did not recognise Christ Jesus. And we asked how was it possible that after three days anyone could fail to recognise in the same form a person previously known. Hence we had to note that Christ appeared to Mary in a changed form, or these words would have no meaning. Here, therefore, a distinction must be kept in mind. First, we have to understand the resurrection as a translation into historic fact of the awakening that took place in the holy mysteries of all times, only with the difference that he who in the mysteries raised up the individual pupil was the hierophant, while the Gospels indicate that he who raised up Christ is the being whom we designate as the Father, that the Father himself raised up the Christ. Here we are shown that what had formerly been carried out on a small scale in the depths of the mysteries was now on once for all enacted for humanity by divine spirits and that the being who is designated as the Father acted as Hierophant in the raising to life of Christ Jesus. Thus we have here enhanced to the highest degree something which formerly had taken place on a small scale in the mysteries. That is the first point. The other is that, interwoven with matters which carry us back to the mysteries, there are descriptions so detailed that even today we can reconstruct from the Gospels the situations, even to their minute particulars, as we have just seen in the passage read to you. But this passage includes one detail that calls for particular attention. There must be a meaning in the words, for they did not as yet know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. Let us ask, of what have the disciples been able so far to convince themselves? It is described as clearly as anything can be that the linen wrappings are there, but the body is not there, is no longer in the grave. The disciples had not been able to convince themselves of anything else, and they understood nothing else when they now went home. Otherwise the words had no meaning. The more deeply you enter into the text, the more you must say that the disciples who were standing by the grave were convinced that the linen wrappings were there, but that the body was no longer in the grave. They went home with the thought, where has the body gone? Who has taken it out of the grave? And now, from the conviction that the body is not there, the Gospels lead us slowly to the events through which the disciples were finally convinced of the resurrection. How were they convinced? Through the fact that, as the Gospels relate, Christ appeared to them by degrees so that they could say, He is there. And this went so far that Thomas, called the doubter, could lay his finger in the prints of the wounds. In short, we can see from the Gospels that the disciples became convinced of the resurrection through Christ having come to them after it as the risen one. The proof for the disciples was that He was there. And if these disciples, who had gradually come to the conviction that Christ was alive, although he had died, had been asked what they actually believed, they would have said, We have proofs that Christ lives. But they certainly would not have spoken as Paul spoke later, after he had gone through his experience on the road to Damascus. Anyone who allows the Gospels and the Pauline epistles to work upon him we notice the deep underlying difference between the fundamental tone of the Gospels as regards the understanding of the resurrection and the Pauline conception of it. Paul indeed draws a parallel between his conviction of the resurrection and that of the Gospels, for in saying Christ is risen, he indicates that Christ, after he had been crucified, appeared as a living being to the Cephas, to the Twelve, then to five hundred brethren at one time. And last of all to himself, Paul, as the one born out of due time, Christ had appeared from out of the fiery glory of the spiritual. Christ had appeared to the disciples also. Paul refers to that, 
and he eventually proved with the risen one with the same for Paul as they had been for the disciples. But what Paul immediately joins to these as the outcome for him of the event of Damascus is his wonderful and easily comprehensible theory of the being of Christ. What from the event of Damascus onwards was the being of Christ for Paul? The being of Christ was for him the second Adam, and he immediately differentiates between the first Adam and the second Adam, the Christ. He calls the first Adam the progenitor of men on earth because he sees in him the first man from whom all other men are descended. For Paul, it is Adam who is bequeathed to human beings the body which they carry about with them as a physical body. All men have inherited their physical body from Adam. This is the body which meets as an external mire and is mortal. It is the body inherited from Adam, the corruptible body, the physical body of man that decays in death. With this body, men are clothed. The second Adam, Christ, is regarded by Paul as possessing, in contrast to the first, the incorruptible, the immortal body. Paul then affirms that through Christian evolution, men are gradually made ready to put on the second Adam in place of the first Adam, the incorruptible body of the second Adam, Christ, in place of the corruptible body of the first Adam. What Paul seems to require of all who call themselves true Christians is something that violates all the old conceptions of the world. As the first corruptible body is descended from Adam, so must the incorruptible body originate from the second Adam, from Christ. Every Christian could say, because I am descended from Adam, I have a corruptible body as Adam had, but in that I set myself in the right relationship to Christ. I receive from him, the second Adam, an incorruptible body. For Paul, this view shines out directly from the experience of Damascus. We can perhaps express what Paul wishes to say by means of a simple diagram. Here we have a number of people, shown as X's, at a given time. Paul will trace them all back to the first Adam, from whom they are all descended, by whom they are given the corruptible body. According to Paul's conception, however, something else is possible. Just as human beings can say, we are related because we are all descended from the one progenitor, Adam. So they can say, as without any action of ours, through the relationships of human generation, lines can be traced back to Adam, so it is possible for us to cause something else to arise within us, something that could make us different beings. Just as the natural lines lead back to Adam, so it must be possible to represent lines which lead not to the corruptible body of the fleshy Adam, but to the body that is incorruptible. Through our relationship to Christ we can, according to the Pauline view, bear this incorruptible body within us, just as through Adam we bear the corruptible body. There is nothing more uncomfortable for the modern consciousness than this idea. For looking at the matter quite soberly, what does it demand from us? It demands something which, for modern thought, is really monstrous. Modern thought has long disputed whether all human beings are descended from one primeval human being. But it may be allowed that all are descended from a single human being who was the first on earth as regards physical consciousness. Paul, however, demands the following. He says, If you desire to be a Christian in the true sense, you must conceive that within you something can arise which can live in you and from which you can draw spiritual lines to a second Adam, to Christ, to that very Christ who on the third day rose from the grave just as all men can trace lines back to the physical body of the first Adam. So Paul demands that all who call themselves Christians should call something within them to arise, something leading to that entity which on the third day rose out of the grave in which the body of Christ Jesus had been laid. Anyone who does not grant this cannot come into any relationship with Paul. He cannot say he understands Paul. If man as regards his corruptible body, is descended from the first Adam, then, by receiving the being of Christ into his own being, he has the possibility of having a second ancestor. This ancestor, however, is he who, on the third day after his body had been laid in the earth, rose out of the grave. 
Let us clearly understand that Paul makes this demand, however displeasing it may be to modern thinkers. From this Pauline statement, we will indeed approach the modern thinker, but one ought not, not to have any other opinion concerning that which meets us so clearly in the Pauline writings. One ought not to twist the meaning of something so clearly expressed by Paul. Certainly it is pleasant to interpret something allegorically and to say it was meant in such and such a way, but all these interpretations make no sense. If we wish to connect a meaning with the Pauline statement, we are bound to say, even if modern consciousness regards it as superstition, that according to Paul, Christ rose from the dead after three days. Let us go further. An assertion such as this made by Paul after he had reached the summit of his initiation through the event of Damascus, the assertion concerning the second Adam and his rising from the grave, could be made only by someone whose whole mode of thought and outlook had been derived from Greek thought by one whose roots were in Greece, even if he were also a Hebrew, by one who in a certain respect had brought all his Hebraism as an offering to the Greek mind. For if we come closer to all this, what is it that Paul really declares? Looking within a vision on that which the Greeks loved and valued, the external form of the human body, concerning which they had the tragic feeling that it comes to an end when the individual passes through the gate of death. Paul says, With the resurrection of Christ, the body has been raised in triumph from the grave. If we are to build a bridge between these two world outlooks, we can best do it in the following way. The Greek hero said from his Greek feeling, Better a beggar in the upper world than a king in the land of shades. He said this because he was convinced that the external form of the physical body, so highly cherished by the Greeks, was lost forever in passing through the gate of death. On this same soil, out of which this tragic mood of intoxication with beauty had grown, Paul appeared, he who first proclaimed the gospel to the Greeks. We do not deviate from his words if we translate them as follows. That which you value above all, the human bodily form, will no longer be destroyed. Christ is risen as the first of those who are raised from the dead. The form of the physical body is not lost, but is given back to humanity through the resurrection of Christ. That which the Greeks valued most highly was given back to them as a resurrection by Paul the Jew, who had been steeped in Greek culture. Only a Greek would so think and speak. But only someone who had become a Greek with all the preconceptions derived from his Jewish ancestry. Only a Jew who had become a Greek could speak in this way, no one else. But how can we approach these things from the standpoint of spiritual science? For we have reached the point of knowing that Paul demands something which thoroughly upsets the calculations of the modern thinker. Let us endeavour from the standpoint of spiritual science to get nearer to what Paul demands. Let us collect what we know from spiritual science so as to bring an idea to meet Paul's statement. When we review the very simplest spiritual scientific truths, we know that man consists of physical body, etheric body, astral body and ego. If now you ask someone who has studied spiritual science a little, but not very thoroughly, whether he knows the physical body of man, he will be sure to answer, I know it quite well, for I see it when a person stands before me. The other members are super sensible, invisible, and one cannot see them, but the physical human body I know very well. Is it really the physical body of man that appears before our eyes when we meet a man with our ordinary vision? I ask you, who without clairvoyant vision has ever seen a physical human body? What is it that people have before them if they see only with physical eyes and physical understanding? A human body, but one consisting of physical body, etheric body, astral body and ego. And when a man stands before us, it is as an organised assembly of physical body, etheric body, astral body and ego. It would make as little sense to say that a physical body stood before us as it would if, when giving someone a glass of water, we were to say, there is hydrogen in that glass. Water consists of hydrogen and oxygen, as man consists of physical, etheric and astral bodies and ego. Their assemblage is visible, just as water is, 
whether the hydrogen and oxygen are not. Anyone who said he saw hydrogen in the water would be obviously mistaken. So is anyone who thinks he sees the physical body when he sees a man in the external world. What he normally sees is not a physical human body, but a four-membered being. He sees the physical body only insofar as it is permeated by the other members of the human being. And it is then changed in the same way that hydrogen is changed when it is permeated with oxygen in water. For hydrogen is a gas and oxygen also. From the two gases united we get a liquid. Why should it be incomprehensible that the man who meets us in the physical world is quite unlike his single members, the physical, etheric and astral bodies and the ego, just as water is quite unlike hydrogen? And so he is. Hence we cannot rely upon the Maya which appears to us as the physical body. We must think of the physical body in a quite different way if we want to draw nearer to its nature. The observation of the physical human body in itself belongs to the most difficult clairvoyant problems, the hardest of all. Suppose we allow the external world to perform on man the experiment which is similar to the disintegration of water into hydrogen and oxygen. In death this experiment is performed by the great world. We then see how man lays aside his physical body. But does he really lay aside his physical body? The question seems absurd. For what could be clearer than the apparent fact that at death man lays aside his physical body? But what is it that he lays aside? It is something no longer imbued with the physical body's most important possession during life, its form. Directly after death, the form begins to withdraw from the dead body. We are left with decaying substances, no longer characterised by the form. The body laid aside is composed of substances and elements which we can trace also in nature, in the natural order of things they would not produce a human form. Yet this form belongs quite essentially to the physical human body. To ordinary clairvoyance it seems evident that at death a person simply discards these material substances which are then handed over to decay or burning and that nothing of the physical body is left. The clairvoyant then observes how after the death the ego, astral body and etheric body remain connected during the person's review of his past life. Then he sees how the etheric body separates itself, how an extract of it remains, while the main portion dissolves in one way or another into the general cosmic ether. It does indeed seem that the person has laid aside his physical body, with its substances and forces, and then, after a few days, the etheric body. When the clairvoyant follows the person further through the Kamaloka period, he sees how an extract of the astral body goes with him during the life between death and a new birth, while the rest of the astral body is given over to the cosmic astrality. So we see that physical, etheric and astral bodies are laid aside, and that the physical body seems to drain away completely into materials and forces which, through decay or burning or some other form of desolation, are returned to the elements. But the more clairvoyance is developed in our time, the clearer will it be that the physical forces and substances laid aside are not the whole physical body, for its complete configuration could never derive from them alone. To these substances and forces there belongs something else, best called the phantom of the man. This phantom is the form shape which as a spiritual texture works up the physical substances and forces so that they fill out the form which we encounter as the man on the physical plane. The sculptor can bring no statue into existence if he merely takes marble or something else and strikes away wildly so that single pieces spring off just as the substance permits. As the sculptor must have the fault which he impresses on the substance, so is a fault related to the human body not in the same way as the fault of the artist, for the material of the human body is not marble or plaster, but is a real fault, the phantom in the external world. Just as the fault of the plastic artist is stamped upon his material, so the phantom of the physical body is stamped upon the substances of the earth, which we see given over, after death, to the grave of the fire. The phantom belongs to the physical body as its enduring part, more important part than the external substances. 
The external substances are merely loaded into the network of the human form, as one might load apples into a cart. You can see how important the phantom is. The substances which fall asunder after death are essentially these we meet externally in nature. They are merely caught up by the human form. If you think more deeply, can you believe that all the work of the great divine spirit through the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods has merely created something which is handed over to death at the elements of the earth? No, that which was developed during the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods is not the physical body that is laid aside at death. It is the phantom, the form of the physical body. We must be quite clear that to understand the physical body is not an easy thing. Above all, this understanding must not be sought for in the world of illusion, the world of Maya. We know that the foundation, the germ of this phantom of the physical body, was laid down by the thrones during the Saturn period. During the Sun period, the spirits of wisdom worked further upon it. The spirits of movement during the Moon period, and the spirits of form during the Earth period. And it is only in this period that the physical body received the phantom. We call these spirits the spirits of form because they really live in the phantom of the physical body. So in order to understand the physical body, we must go back to the phantom. If we look back to the beginning of our earth existence, we can say that the hosts from the ranks of the higher hierarchies who had prepared the physical human body in its own proper form during the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods up to the earth period had from the outset placed this phantom within the earth evolution. In fact, the phantom, which cannot be seen with the physical eye, was what was first there of the physical body of man. It is a transparent body of force. With what the physical eye sees are the physical substance which a person eats and takes into himself, and they fill out the invisible phantom. If the physical eye looks upon a physical body, what it sees is the mineral part that fills the physical body not the physical body itself. But how has this mineral part found its way into the phantom of man's physical body? To answer this question, let us picture once more the genesis, the first becoming of man on earth. From Saturn, Sun and Moon, there came over that network of forces which in its true form meets us as the invisible phantom of the physical body. For a higher clairvoyance, it appears as phantom only when we look away from all the external substance that fills it out. This is the phantom which stands at the starting point of man's earth existence, when he was invisible as a physical body. Let us suppose that to this phantom of the physical body, the etheric body is added. Will the phantom then become visible? Certainly not, for the etheric body is invisible for ordinary sight. Thus, the physical body as phantom, plus the etheric body, is still invisible to external physical sense. And the astral body even more so, hence the combination of physical body as phantom with the etheric and astral bodies is still invisible. And when the ego is added, it would certainly become perceptible inwardly, but not externally visible. Thus, as man came over out of the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods, he was still visible only to a clairvoyant. How did he become visible? But for the occurrence described in the Bible symbolically and factually in occult science as the entry of the Lucifer influence, he would not have become visible. What happened through that influence? Read what is said in occult science. Out of that path of evolution in which his physical, etheric and astral bodies were still invisible, man was thrown down into denser matter and was compelled under the influence of Lucifer to take this denser matter into himself. If the Lucifer force had not been introduced into our astral body and ego, this dense materiality would not have become as visible as it has become. Hence we have to represent man as an invisible being, made visible in matter only through forces which entered into him under the influence of Lucifer. Through this influence, external substances and forces are drawn into the domain of the phantom and permeate it. As when we pour a coloured fluid into a transparent glass, so that the glass looks coloured, so we can imagine that the Lucifer influence poured forces into the human phantom, 
with the result that man was adapted for taking in on earth the requisite substances and forces which make his form visible. Otherwise, his physical body would have remained always invisible. The alchemists always insisted that the human body really consists of the same substance that constitutes the perfectly transparent, crystal clear philosopher's stone. The physical body is itself entirely transparent, and it is the Lucifer forces in man which have brought him to a non transparent state and placed him before us so that he is opaque and tangible. Hence, you will understand that man has become a being who takes up external substances and forces of the earth which are given off again at death, only because Lucifer tempted him, and certain forces were poured into his astral body. It follows that because the ego entered into connection with the physical, etheric and astral bodies under the influence of Lucifer, man became what he is on earth, and otherwise would not have been the bearer of a visible, earthly organism. Now let us suppose that at a certain point of time in life, the ego were to go out from a human organism so that there stood before us physical, etheric and astral bodies, but not the ego. This is what happened in the case of Jesus of Nazareth in the 30th year of his life. The human ego then left this cohesion of physical, etheric and astral bodies. And into this cohesion the Christ being entered at the baptism in Jordan. We now have the physical, etheric and astral bodies of a man and the Christ being. The Christ being had now taken up his abode in a human organism, as otherwise the ego would have done. What now differentiates this Christ Jesus from all other men on earth? It is this, that all other men bear within them an ego that once was overcome by Lucifer's temptation. But Jesus no longer bears an ego within him. Instead, he bears the Christ being. So that from this time, Beginning with the baptism in Jordan, Jesus bears within himself the residual effects that had come from Lucifer, but with no human ego to allow any further Luciferic influences to enter his body. A physical body, an etheric body, an astral body, in which the residue of the earlier Luciferic influences was present, but into which no more Luciferic influence could enter, and the Christ being, thus was Christ Jesus constituted. Let us set before us exactly what the Christ is from the baptism in Jordan until the mystery of Golgotha, a physical body, an etheric body and an astral body which makes this physical body together with the etheric body visible because it still contains the residue of the Luciferic influence. Because the Christ being had the astral body that Jesus of Nazareth had had from birth to his 30th year, the physical body was visible as the bearer of the Christ. Thus, from the time of the baptism in Jordan, we have before us a physical body which as such would not be visible on the physical plane, an etheric body which as such would not have been perceptible, the astral body which makes the other two bodies visible, and so makes the body of Jesus of Nazareth into a visible body, and within this organism, the Christ being. We will inscribe firmly in our souls this fourfold nature of Christ Jesus, saying to ourselves, Every person who stands before us on the physical plane consists of physical body, etheric body, astral body and ego. And this ego is such that it always works into the astral body up to the hour of death. The Christ Jesus being, however, stands before us as one who had physical body, etheric body and astral body, but no human ego. So that during the three years up to his death, he was not subject to the influences that normally work upon human beings. The only influence came from the Christ being. From this starting point we will continue tomorrow.